And uh, I just want to say at this point, the way I met Ryan and we ended up getting him as a speaker was last April. I, I work in Newport, so sometimes I walk down to uh, Newport Shipyard. I post some photos on Facebook that some of you like. I know Jamie likes a lot of them. But uh, I happened to be down there, and uh, it was a Wednesday, the lending club uh, had just come in, and all the foul weather gear was hanging up and all of this. And I met Ryan on the dock, and I just started talking to him and whatnot. And um, it turns out, the Saturday night before, um, they had left the docks to break the Newport to Bermuda record, and they, they left, I think it was like 10 in the, at night. By the time they got the main up off Jamestown and got going towards Bermuda, it was after midnight. So they technically left like Sunday morning, and they got to Bermuda before Sunday night. So they, they got to Bermuda in under 24 hours, which is like the thicker. Um, <laughs> we'll get 40 knots at the end. We can tell you all about that. But, so, so then they, 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 they broke the record. That's, that was their mission, to break the record. They had a night sleeper here or five or whatever that was. And they turned around and came back to Newport. And they tied up very early. They were actually early at 4 in the morning. They had to wait for the little Zodiacs to help them. Because they can't maneuver that sort of the dock without the Zodiac. So they tied up early Wednesday morning, and I show up at lunchtime, and I had met Ryan on the dock. And I said, oh, so when you came back, how, how fast did you go? So, oh, well, we, we didn't have the full racing crew. We had some guests from Lending Club, and we took it easy, you know, so it wasn't really a record break. Well, how fast did you go? Well, like 28 hours or something. It's, it's, <laughs> that's how he announced his 28 hours. I went, I went to Bermuda on skateaway, Keith Barrage and 40 foot trimaran, and we did it in like 58 or 60, and we thought that was crazy fast. <laughs> Unbelievable. So anyway, the funny part of the story was, so Ryan starts chuckling, and he's telling me about the, the customs guy in Newport, and he said, oh, I had a really hard time this morning. He's like half asleep. I said, what do you mean? Well, the customs guy comes down the dock, and he says, you know, he's looking for a big 105 foot trimer in, and he says, um, so where are you coming from? Bermuda. He says, well, where were you in Bermuda before you got to Bermuda? So well, right here at this dock in Newport. Oh, okay. And when did you leave? Saturday, <laughs> Wednesday morning, and, and the, the customs guy says, now listen young man, I've been doing this a long time and I work for the U.S. government, no monkey business here. He, said, and he, he was like lecturing Ryan, to, and he's like, no, serious, look at this thing, man. <laughs> he scares all salty and everything. So that was kind of a funny story, uh, how I met Ryan. Uh, anyway, so in, um, Besides that, the lending club story, uh, in 2014, he was first place IMOCA class New York to Barcelona race on Yugo Boss. You might have heard of that quote. In 2013, he was the first place multi hall and first to finish the Transpac on the Orma 72 lending club. Uh, 2013, world speed sailing record holder on the Golden Route from New York to San Francisco in 47 days on board the Volvo Ocean 70 Maserati. Uh, 2012, fourth place. Uh, Cries Ocean Race, New York to Brest, France on the Mod 70 uh, Musantan. So the list goes on, but as you can see, he's a very accomplished sailor. We're fortunate to have him. I'd like to welcome Ryan Bramer. Thank you. Uh, i got to figure out how far away to hold it. It's nice to be here. Um, it's really good to be here and see everybody. Um, Who's having a good time and uh, racing your boats against each other and um, having fun while doing it because that seems to me to be uh, in this country uh, a rare commodity people who actually uh, come and do this and then can be friends at the end of the day I do have a little bit of a bone to pick with Peter though because um, he's stolen the name of the boat that I work on on the West Coast uh, yeah tritium tritium is the uh, the radioactive um, isotope of hydrogen <laughs> and it also is a very nice name for a trimaran since it has tri in the name. And so, um, you know, he and I, we have, a, we have a little bit to talk about when this is all over, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if we could be half as successful with, uh, with tritium as, um, as he is with... Uh, oh, you got to help me out here. So I'll, uh, I'll just do it like that. Is that right? Yeah, there we go. Perfect. So yeah, if we could be half as successful with the 72-footer that we did the Transpac in 2013 with as he is with uh, with his F-27, then we'd actually be getting somewhere in life, I'd say. Um, which is actually a nice segue into the beginning of my presentation. But before I get started, um, 
as he said, uh, I know that question and answer is uh, the, the most important thing when anybody talks like this. And um, generally, when I do a presentation like this, it's probably about 20 minutes long, and then there's about 40 minutes of discussion afterwards. So don't worry, everybody. We're going we're gonna to do the same thing this evening. Um, so th this whole thing tonight is, um, is about the transpac record. Because um, I was in France uh, on the Moussin Dam uh, years ago, and I got a funny, um, I got a funny Skype request. You know, uh, please, uh, please uh, join my contacts on Skype from a guy named John Sengmeister on the West Coast, who I had no idea who he was. And with a funny name like that, I kind of thought that it was um, just bullshit, and so I was ready to just uh, block it. And I said, you know what, maybe I'll just Google the name and see what comes up. Turns out that the guy's done two America's Cups with Dennis Conner in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, Fremantle and all the rest of it. Has a big restaurant in Long Beach. And um, I said, okay. And uh, so I click accept uh, this request. And 10 seconds later, the guy calls me up. And he says, you know, um, you don't know me. I know you. I follow what you're doing. and." Uh, I'm looking to buy a big multi hall because I want to break the transpac record. And I said, oh, okay, well, here we go. And I said, um, I hate to be poor with you, but um, do you know what a big multi hall costs to do the transpac record? He says, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. He says, you know, I don't have any money. He says, but for me, you know, we have to be able to do 17 knots average all the way to Hawaii. We're not racing against anybody else. It doesn't care what shape the, you know, it doesn't matter what shape the boat's in or anything else. We're just going to do it. And I said to him, okay, well, let me think about it, and I'll call you back tomorrow, and we'll talk about this. Just because I wanted to get a little separation and figure out a little more about who he was and everything else. <clears throat> and Artemis had, um, had bought a Norma 60 and modified it to 72 feet on the floaters so that they could um, practice the, for the America's Cup without breaking any of the surrogate rules. And I knew that boat was going to be available for sale, and I told him, go and buy that boat. And um, so when I said that to him the next day, he said, okay, fine, I will, and I'll, I'll talk to you later. I said, oh, great. And I thought I had dodged a bullet. In fact, I hadn't dodged anything. He calls me back a month later, and he says, Ryan, Ryan, I did it. I'm like, you did what? He says, well, I bought the boat like you told me to. <laughs> Oh, shit, are you kidding me? <laughs> no, no, I bought it. It's, it's, coming, it's coming to the West Coast. We're going to do the Transpac on it. I said, oh, great. Oh, well, that's good for you. That's going to be awesome. And this is, this is the boat. Um, 60 feet on the central hull, 72 feet on the floaters, 17 feet of bowsprit for an overall length of 77 feet. Um, and I said, so what can I do for you now? And he says, well... I need some sales. Can you find me some sales in France? I said, I said then let me guess, you don't want to spend any money on that either, do you? He says, no, no more than I have to. So anyway, I found him some sales, and, um, and off we went. So uh, I finished with the gold route on Maserati, and uh, I found the boat um, in more or less, well, not quite that safe. It didn't have a mast. It didn't have any deck hardware. It didn't have any electronics. Um, it didn't have any decorations pure white and in pieces in a parking lot. And um, when I finished with Maserati, he says, Ryan, can you come and put the boat together for me? We're going to do the Transpac, and I've got some sponsors, and it's going to be great. We're going to have an awesome time. I said, OK, fine. And it, it turns out that he, he has some friends who did the cup who are now in investment banking in New York. And um, they convinced the CEO of Lending Club to put some money down to, uh, to be part of the project. So uh, the boat became Lending Club. The Transpac in 2013, we sailed under Lending Club colors. Um, this was uh, just going around Catalina uh, at the start of the Transpac, you know, 15 miles offshore off the coast of Long Beach. You have these little islands that are marked of course, you have to leave in the port. Uh, the boat looked really good there. Uh, it's an old, uh, an old jib from He Dropped There, uh, a mainsail from uh, Orange Project, the uh, the dagger boards are, the foils are original, the dagger boards there, the, the green on the bow is a, um, a code zero which we recut from the uh, group bomb of all those 70. So, you know, it was, a, it was that kind of project. <laughs> and, uh, 
we basically um, <clears throat> we basically uh, put a canting mask on the boat, and the week before the start of the transpac, we canted the mask twice uh, on the day before the transpac, and then we started. So that was kind of that was the trial by fire of the project. <laughs> but everything was good. Um, it was shortly after the tsunami in Japan, and um, unfortunately what happened is that um, the weather that year was a nice breeze out of the north, so we were reaching along, and we were staying fairly far north to stay in the good breeze, uh, which basically put us into the tsunami debris. We ended up um, smashing up the boat pretty badly. We kept hitting things with the central dagger board, not things, but telephone poles, uh, logs from Oregon, or maybe they had come from Japan, but I think they are just basically like logs that had washed out of the rivers in Oregon and gone down the coast. So uh, after we hit the dagger board uh, twice and end friended it twice and uh, hit the foils and hit everything else, we basically were outside of the record. The transpec is a funny thing because just like uh, with all these different events, you can do uh, the race record, which means you have to start on the day of the race, or you can do the course record, which means you can start anytime you want as long as you do the course. So the, uh, the transpec race record stands at five days and nine hours. Um, we missed it by two hours. We finished in five days and 11 hours, which we were pretty sad about, especially me. I'd worked seven days a week for three months getting the boat ready, so it was a pretty shitty, uh, shitty deal to not finish in the allotted time. Um, and at the time, the, uh, the course record was four days and 19 hours. Um, as I said before, we had a lending club who had decided that they wanted to, to sponsor the boat. The CEO of Lending Club is a guy named Renaud Laplanche, and he uh, he sailed the laser when he was young in France. He was the French national laser champion in 89 and 92 or something like that, uh, preparing for the Barcelona Olympics, and instead he decided to, to go to law school. Um, he did this race with us, and uh, he got the record-breaking bug. Before we'd even finished the race, he and I were discussing what project was going to be next, what boat were we going to find to break the Transpac record in 2015. And uh, so as soon as, as soon as the race finished, we sort of continued down that vein trying to figure out what to do next. We, uh, we talked about Gitana 11, which is uh, very similar to Tritium with a, a little more central hull. It's 77 feet on all three hulls. It's a modified 60-footer. Uh, we discussed um, the Ormus 60 that's on the uh, on the west coast as a possibility as well. Um, that wasn't really available because they were talking about doing the race themselves. We also discussed uh, Group Ama 3, Mod 70s, everything you can imagine. Um, so after a whole lot of shenanigans for six months or so, we finally managed to get our hands on the big boat, on the Group Ama 3. Um, this was the boat when it was pretty much first launched. Um, it was the most innovative thing out there at the time. All the other boats had been catamarans, and they'd been very heavy and very big. Orange 2 and uh, all the G-class multi-hulls. So uh, this boat was uh, a bit shorter, a lot wider, and much, much lighter than anyone else. It was, uh, it was well, well ahead of its time. Unfortunately, maybe slightly more ahead of its time than it should have been. They, uh, they started there around the world. Uh, the second time they tried to go around the world, they managed to get down into the Southern Ocean and they turned the thing over uh, about 200 miles south of New Zealand. What you can see here is the, the other floater of the boat, which is underneath of it right there, because it had broken off the beams and gone under the boat when they capsized. Um, fortunately, they towed the thing home, <coughs> put it on a ship, took it back to France and rebuilt it, and the next year they, uh, they did uh, 48 days around the world which was the last, uh, the last big uh, crude around the world event they did. After that, they, uh, the boat won the route to Rome twice, single-handed with a short mast, um, most recently with Bank Populaire. We got the boat from Bank Populaire. Um, we had a month to get it into shape in, uh, in, in Lorient in Brittany. Um, these boats, you know, I, I've done a lot of different things in my life with uh, technical preparation and racing boats and everything else, but this is um, this is another another story completely. It's uh, just the logistical nightmare of dealing with something like this is, is is unbelievable. You know, the boat's 105 feet long, 75 feet wide. The mast is 140 feet tall, and it weighs 16 tons. Uh, with 19 feet of draft when the board's all the way down. 
So we uh, we were trying to uh, to rebrand the boat between uh, the Bank Populaire branding and the Lending Club branding in February in uh, in nice rainy Brittany. Fortunately, we had good weather. We were talking about building a tent over the boat, and I started to get some quotes. And when I got the quotes, I realized that I was well out of the ballpark on the on the money part of it because they were quoting me 60,000 euros to build a tent over top of the boat. And I said, how in the hell can it be so expensive? And they said, well, you're talking about a tent which is 700 square meters. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I hadn't really thought about it that way, but when you say it that way, it makes sense. Um, we, had, uh, we had 10 people working for a month um, to try to change the branding. Um, all the blue is vinyl, all the white is bottom paint, all the red is vinyl. So we had to strip off everything that said Bank Populaire, repaint the deck white because there was plenty of blue and Bank Populaire there, and then uh, get the sails in shape and everything else. The, um, fortunately, we had young people. The, um, even, the, even the aerodynamic fairings on the beams used to say Bank Populaire. So you can see these, these youngsters, we had them uh, in that rudimentary uh, masks and <laughs> and gloves, acetoning all of the paint off the boat everywhere. We also did the sails that way. We took all the group armor off of the sails. Uh, we actually had um, electric sanders, and then we had, um, instead of sandpaper, we'd put an indoor-outdoor carpet onto the sandpaper. Instead of sandpaper, with acetone, we'd dump acetone on the sail, and they would sand it with the indoor-outdoor carpet. <laughs> And that was the way we took all of the uh, took all the paint off the sails so that we could repaint it in lending club colors. Um, it was a lot of work. We did, it was we basically had ten people on work for thirty days straight to to rebrand the boat. As you can see here, uh, a view from above. Luckily, we had a drone. We had a guy who had a drone who was able to take some pretty cool shots. So you can see the boat in between two buildings. It's amazing they get it in between the two. It was an Austin Powers moment to get it in, you know, like get back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, what's interesting about that picture is the size of the rig next to the boat. You know, when you see the wing mast, which is bigger than the floater, it, it's, a, it's a pretty good indication as to the power that you're going to have afterwards. It's interesting, here's another shot of it. If, if you guys have never been to France, um, and you're into multi-hulls, L'Oreal is, um, is mecca for multi-hulls. Um, one, because the French like it, and two, because they have a, a, an amazing physical plant to do it. Um, the concrete building behind the boat is the submarine base in L'Oreal. The, the Germans built this place. It's, um, it's something like 60 feet tall, and uh, the walls and the roof are five meters thick of concrete, um, with the roof having a further two meters of granite on top of it. And it, what they were basically doing is the Germans were pulling their, they used uh, French prisoner of war labor to build these huge buildings. They were pulling their subs into them, repairing them, and sending them back out after the Allied shipping. And now they, uh, the French government couldn't figure out how to take them down because they're so big. And uh, all of the French teams use these buildings as bases at this stage. Uh, Laura and I, who built the masks for boats like this, is, is in one of the biggest sheds, and then uh, there's a few other different companies who are, who are also working on it. Putting the boat in the water is interesting as well. We have, um, it's a 300 ton crane. First, uh, you've got to pick the boat up from the, uh, the chain plates and the four stage chain plate. Uh, when you pick it up, just pick it up a little bit, and then you use a winch. Uh, one of the cockpit winches, and you pull the central rudder into the boat and bolt that off so it stays in place. Then you put the boat in the water. Once the boat's in the water, you use a crane to put the dagger board in. Then you use two cranes to pick the rig up. And then the one crane that's got the top of the rig puts the rig into the boat. Um, you can see there, you can see the, the little people on the dock here versus the size of everything else that's there. It's uh, it's, it's not human scale anymore when you have a boat this big. It's, um, like I said, it's, it's, it's a massive boat. And uh, just, just sort of as a, a way of comparing things, this boat has 155 ton meters of riding room, which basically means if you have the mast, and at the bottom you put a lever that was one meter long, you'd have to put 155 tons on it to resist the sails. And the boat can do that. Whereas on a Volvo 70, 
you have 44 centimeters of writing limit. So basically, a lot more powerful than Volvo 70. Um, another way of looking at it, this is me at the top of the mast when we put the rig in the boat. The top of the mast is bigger than I am, 140 feet in the air. So uh, we were we were pretty late because it took us a long time to do things with the with the uh, bad weather and everything we had in Brittany. You can see it wasn't a very nice day that day when we were putting the rig in the boat. Uh, and our first event was the Calcedinar record. Uh, we needed to get it done very quickly because we were scheduled to be in the United States very quickly. So normally when you put a boat like this in the water, you go out and you put it in a third reef in the J3, go sailing around, make sure nothing breaks. Second reef, J2, uh, make sure nothing breaks. On the other hand, we we went out and we put up the biggest jib and the full main. We did uh, 40 knots within about 15 minutes. <laughs> and then... Uh, Nothing broke. Oh uh, no, nothing broke. No, it was, it, I don't know whether it's whether it's luck or whether we're really really good, but we put the thing together properly. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that was that. Uh, the next day we left to the, we left to go to England to do the Calcedinar record. Um, Calcedinar, you know, you have the you have the Isle of Wight here. Calcedon on the north side of the Isle of Wight. So then you have to get out and then go all the way down to Dinard, which is back on the northern coast of France. Um, so basically you need northwesterly wind in an attempt to get out of the Solent without tacking. As you can see, we didn't have that, that luxury. We, um, we spent an hour in the Solent, tacked five times on a record, which is only going to be a duration of about five hours. So we, uh, we lost 20% uh, of our time in the first 11 miles of the 140-mile uh, record, which wasn't too good. Uh, fortunately, um, out in the channel, it was uh, definitely blowing very quickly, very strongly. Um, that was the state of the boat. We had a helicopter that followed us in the very beginning of the record, um, just flying along. The, uh, the boat is like a beach catamaran. If you have the right amount of sail area up, you can fly two hulls without any trouble. You can turn it over without any trouble. Um, to keep it like this, to keep the to keep the two hulls out of the water and go very fast, you basically have to have four people grinding on the traveler in low gear on coffee grinders the entire time, because uh, the boat gets up a little bit. The guy eases about three feet, and everybody goes shit, and they start grinding and they grind and they grind and they grind and. As, you, as they grind, you can feel it in the helm. The boat just lifts up, the helm gets more loaded, and then it, it comes out of the water, the helm unloads, and the boat takes off again. So we, uh, we did that. You know, we, uh, we didn't have the best weather window on Earth, and that's um, something that we were learning as a young record-breaking crew. You know, we had, um, we had a crew of guys, uh, some of whom had a lot of experience with record-breaking, others of us didn't have that much experience. And um, looking at the weather, we were more inclined to look at the wind angle and the wind strength and say, oh, well, we got good breeze in the right direction, let's go. And all the old timers said, you've got to be careful about the waves because the boat won't go fast in wave. You're going to break the thing. We've got to slow it down. Uh, it's not going to be good. And um, before we started the record, everybody was super freaked out that we were going to destroy the thing. Um, and as you can see, we were leaping out of the water quite a lot because we had big waves. Um, we didn't really have a lot of choice because, as I said, we needed to get to the United States. Um, and we slowed it down just to the, the very, the fastest speed we felt like we could go. We managed to get the record, which was nice. Um, we learned a lot of lessons in a very short period of time. We only sailed for about five hours. Um, there you have it. You can see we, uh, the previous record was made in two, five hours and 23 minutes, and we, uh, we managed to beat it by, uh, by nine minutes, five hours and 14 minutes. And, um, and since then, the Mod 70 Fado has already beaten us by, I don't know what that is, 23 minutes or something like that. So <coughs> within six months of getting the record, we've already lost it. The boss has already said to me that he wants us to go and get it back when we get a new boat to get it back with. But, uh, We'll see. We'll see how that goes. At that stage, the boat left to go to the United States. They, uh, I wasn't on board because I just had a new baby. Uh, the boat, uh, thanks. Yeah, the boat, uh, the boat left, and seven days later was in Newport, which was good. Uh, we were on a very tight schedule. You know, we had uh, 
we basically had six months to do uh, this entire circuit, finishing with a trans pack, which is a lot of miles. And so we, you know, most of the time when you set records, you have, oh, uh, you know, we're going to stay here for a month and a half or two months and, and uh, just wait for the weather, and then we'll get the perfect weather, and then we'll go. No, we didn't have that. We normally had, like, maybe a week of waiting before we absolutely had to go. So whatever the closest thing to good weather was, we took it and we pushed the boat. And fortunately, we, we managed to do what we needed to do. Uh, when we got to the U.S. In, uh, in the beginning of April, we were super lucky. Um, the weather was beautiful in Newport, sunny, no wind. Um, it was great because we, uh, we put the boat on the dock and we did a whole bunch of work. We had the whole crew there and uh, after, after seven days delivery from, uh, from England, they, uh, they told me they'd been going downwind with the, the, the storm jib and three reefs in the mainsail and 70 knots of breeze. I thought that was a lot. <laughs> Apparently they got there quickly that way. Um, we had plenty of work to do to get the boat into a state where we could actually uh, do the next record to uh, to Bermuda. Um, one thing about this program, which was important to me and important to uh, to Reno, was that we tried to expose as many people as we could to this kind of sailing, um, and it was sort of the rule that if you were if you were working and somebody showed up on the dock and was looking at the boat and uh, sort of standing around looking at it, you would invite them on board and say, hey, come and have a look around, come look down below, and come check things out and see what you think of it. Um, that wasn't always that popular with the crew who had a lot of work to do, but the deal was that uh, no matter what, if someone asked or if you saw somebody standing around, you were, you were to make them feel welcome. Um, we had we had a lot of situations like this where we had uh, where we had people who were who were grinding for us or who were um, who were checking out the uh, the systems on the boat while we were working. You know, we had a we had an awful lot to do, but we um, we made sure we had time for for young people like these guys who uh, who hopefully are thinking about uh, sailing around the world and breaking records and all the rest of it. Uh, you know, I read a book when I was young about the Steinlager Whitbread campaign, and that's what got me convinced that. Uh, it was a viable decision to, to go out and go try to race sailboats for a living. And uh, hopefully I've uh, managed to repay that with some young people with this program. <clears throat> it also was nice because it meant that the time you spent talking to somebody, you didn't actually have to work on the boat. <laughs> Everyone. <Everywhere. laughs> um, we found a very good weather window for the, um, for the Newport to Bermuda race um, record. We didn't do it during the race. We did it as a record, a pure record. Um, basically, the boat wants a 110 to 120 true wind angle, just like any boat. And uh, the flatter the water, the better. Uh, and the flatter water, we figured out after the um, after the Casa Dinard record, that it was probably more important than the wind. You know, the Casa Dinard, we had 35 knots of breeze, and that was plenty, maybe too much with big sea state, and here we had 20 to 25 knots of breeze uh, with flat water, and the boat actually was probably two or three knots faster, more or less, in the flat water. Um, as you can see, we, did a, we had a very, very straight course um, to Bermuda. We actually were only five miles off a theoretical minimum that you can possibly do between the two points, so that's, um, that's also a pretty big deal if you want to break a record, just not wasting your time doing extra miles, so. <coughs> As you can see here, um, it was pretty flat. That's during the record. Um, no matter what, even if it's flat, when you're doing nearly 40 knots of boat speed, you have somebody who's holding onto the jib sheet to lure to make sure that you're not going to bury the bow and put the thing on its ear. So uh, there you have it. We we basically, like you said, we we left um, we left the dock at about 10:30 or 11 o'clock at night, knowing that we wanted to be leaving. Um, past uh, beaver tail at about three in the morning, which meant that um, we were finishing just about at sunset. We had a, we had a very nice sunset from the Bermuda, um, as you normally do. <laughs> and there's our, there's our, uh, our core crew of people that we finished the, uh, the record with. Um, the two guys on the bottom left are uh, very experienced, Roland Jourdain in the middle there, and Jean-Baptiste Louvaillon. Those two are um, sort of demigods of French sailing, uh, especially in multi-hulls. Um, Stan Delbar to the right is uh, 
was the boat captain for Maiden 2 for many years, who holds most of the records we were trying to beat. Renaud Laplanche is over on the right. He's the, the CEO of Lending Club, and then myself and Boris Herman, who I sail around the world with, and Jan Meyer, who's, uh, who's my boat captain these days when I have a project like this, who has been sailing on the East Coast his whole life. He grew up on a boat. So. What was his name? Jan Meyer. You got, some of you guys probably know him from Newport. Again, uh, pretty beautiful place to arrive when you're, uh, when you're finished with a record. The, uh, the St. George's Dinghy Club uh, have a pretty spectacular site there, so always happy to get in there. And this record I think we're going to hold for a while. Um, the PlayStation record was one day in 14 hours. We've done it in 23 hours and 9 minutes, um, which is a, a pretty decent amount off of the record in terms of percentages. So. It's very cool, you know, I, sa I sailed on PlayStation uh, around that same time, maybe a couple of years after that, and met Steve Fawcett, and uh, I really have a lot of respect for him, and uh, I feel like if he, if he's up there watching at this point, he's seen that we're kicking the shit out of his records, and he probably prefers that to just getting beaten by nine minutes, you know, so, <laughs> so there you have it. We, uh, like he said, we came back from Bermuda pretty quickly as well, it took us 30 hours to come back from Bermuda. Um, but it wasn't quite so nice. Uh, going through the Gulf Stream, there was quite a lot of weather. You can see the water spout in the clouds there. That water spout at, at the closest was about 50 yards from the boat, and I was driving the thing, scared out of my mind that we were going to turn it over with nothing you could do about it because we had plenty of breeze. And you know, with multi hull, you can't always make whatever sort of course deviation you want. So, anyway, uh, we managed to just barely skirt around it and get away from it, but it was. Uh, it was pretty hairy weather for a while. Coming back to New York, um, in New York we had our first um, we had our first week of uh, PR sailing with Lending Club guests. Um, we were very lucky again in New York. The weather was beautiful. Um, it was quite light, but it was sunny every day. And uh, even if it's light, that boat would go pretty quick. So um, it was awfully nice to. Uh, not have it be raining, freezing cold, and blowing 35 in the middle of the harbor there. The kids from the Harvard School in, uh, on uh, Governor's Island there liked it quite a lot. They came out with us for a day and didn't have to go to school, which they're, I guess, pretty <laughs> impressed with. <laughs> I would have been, I'm sure. And just, uh, just as you can imagine, we, uh, we definitely had our obligatory, uh, obligatory shots with the Statue of Liberty, which everyone who comes in there does. Um, so that was, uh, that was pretty much the end of April, and uh, in the beginning of June we needed to be in New York, uh, sorry, in San Francisco to do a lot more PR sailing uh, in the month before the, before the Transpac record. Um, again, I left the boat in the hands of Jan and my boat captain. They did, um, they did New York to Panama, which is 2,000 miles in four days, which is, which is pretty good. That's a, that's a shot from the... Uh, that's a shot from there. 117 true wind dangle at 38 knots. That means they have probably 20 to 25 knots of breeze. And they sustained that the whole way there. It was, uh, it was pretty amazing. On the other hand, sitting in the canal was uh, awfully slow for them because uh, the boat is 75 feet wide. The canal is 100 feet wide, which means there's 12 feet on either side of the boat. Um, the boat has a 55 horsepower motor, which means that Unless you're moving at a decent clip, the thing won't go straight. So you can kind of see right here, there's a Zodiac underneath of the boat. Um, we had a Zodiac underneath the front beam and underneath the rear beam, tied sideways to the boat, acting as balanced stern thrusters, more or less, to get the thing straight through the canal, which was, uh, which was a big deal. So they managed to successfully get through. Um, as you can see, it was... Uh, it was calm in that picture, but they said they had up to 20, 25 knots. It was rain squalls, and it must have been a little hairier then. Again, I wasn't with them, thank God. <laughs> I only got to go uh, for all the really nice uh, sailing, you know. We, uh, we did five weeks of sailing in San Francisco Bay with, um, with Lending Club employees, uh, with clients of Lending Club, with invitees of guests of clients, of you name it, they all came. The, uh, the boss said that he wanted to make sure that uh, everybody in the company who wanted to go sailing on the boat could. That's 1,100 people. Oh. So um, it was a lot. We did, um, <coughs> we did four or five groups of people 
a day with 15 people in each group for an hour and a half each. Um, in San Francisco Bay, because it's breezy, you can do 40 knots with every group, which is really cool. <laughs> so you don't have to be out for very long if you do 40 knots. Um, plus, you get them under the Golden Gate Bridge. They can yell. At, when you yell on the boat, you can hear the echoes off the top of the bridge. I'm sure you can do the same thing with the current sound and narrows. Um, they said that they uh, they said that some of the uh, people that work with Renault, not the people from the Landing Club, but the investors, said that they were doing deals on the boat. Uh, in the multi-million dollar range, and uh, the, the, the quote of our five weeks there was, this is a shitload better than tickets to the ball game. <laughs> 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 Which I can imagine. Here's, um, here's two of the guys who thought that it was very, very exciting. Um, we get, between the week in New York and the five weeks in San Francisco, we took 1,530 people out sailing. Wow. We were very proud of that, as there's 1,530 people Probably a hundred of them had never been on a boat before. We had a, um, it's, it's a funny story. We, uh, I would give a little safety briefing at the beginning of each group, and I would say, listen, I give this typical briefing, don't put your hands in the blocks, watch out for the ropes and all the rest of it. And then I would say, listen, if you want to drive the boat, you just have to come and ask me. No matter when it is, you're perfectly welcome to drive. And um, so some people would say, oh yeah, I want to drive right now, and other times we would have groups where nobody would want to drive. And um, one of the first days we were out there, um, I'm driving along, and there's three or four uh, Asian girls behind me. And uh, I can hear them all giggling and poking at each other, you know, see them like, oh, you go first, oh no, you go first, oh no, but you go first. Oh, no. Finally I turn around and say, which one of you guys is going to drive first? <laughs> They all sort of shoved one girl forward, and she says, all right, what do I do? I said, can you drive a car? And she says, yeah, I can drive a car. I said, well, you can drive a boat then. It's pretty easy. You have a wheel. It's the same difference. Her hands touch the wheel, and the three girls behind her start chanting, DWA, DWA, DWA. And I was like, you, you can't be serious driving while Asian. Apparently, they talk about themselves the same way everyone else <laughs> I said, I can't believe you're saying this. Just, well, everybody knows Asian girls can't drive. <laughs> I tell you what, it was, it was, honestly, it was hard for me to, uh, it, was, you know, it, was, it was hard. <laughs> anyway, San Francisco, there you have it. We had a very good time. We, uh, obviously, while you're in San Francisco, you've got to try to make a show of it. And, uh, you can see Alcatraz Island in the background, flying two hulls. The boat is very easy to sail like this because the bigger the multi-hull, the longer it takes to tip over. And so during that time, you have plenty of opportunity to ease the main sheet or whatever and make sure it doesn't flip over. Uh, it does freak you out, though. The thing's 140 feet tall. If you turn it over, it's like turning over a mid-sized hotel, you know? <laughs> it was all I could do to get them to hold the main sheet long enough to get the thing up. I had to, I had to, I had to bitch at them, actually. Come on, stop. Stop using the main sheet. We gotta keep the thing up because we had a helicopter there and everything else. So finally, they uh, they got up enough nerve to hang onto the main sheet, and that's the end result. The boat just sails around like that without any trouble. Um, it's upwind because that's obviously the easiest to fly at all. You just sail it upwind like that. Um, upwind, the boat's doing 25 knots when you when you sail at all, when you sail in the hulls of the water. Um, the interesting thing is this is the same picture blown up. You can see the size of the. You can see the size of my head there compared to the boat. <laughs> you really don't want to turn the thing over when you imagine how big it is, especially in the middle of the bay with the uh, the shipping and the ferries and the pleasure boats and the people swimming across underneath the Golden Gate Bridge and everything you can imagine. Yeah, that was. Uh, that's the money shop. That's on the wall at Lending Club headquarters, which is pretty good. One thing that was interesting, and this is sort of a different story entirely, but uh, we had plenty of people on foiling kite boards who wanted to race us. <laughs> and foiling kite boards, okay, they're quick. But a foiling kite board reaching can just barely keep up, maybe. And upwind and downwind, they're nowhere close. These guys would, um, they'd, come, they'd, they'd come up next to us while we were reaching along, and they'd sell them, they'd be tripped in, just shaking, you can see their legs shaking, trying to keep the thing upright and everything else. 
And then uh, if we bear away to go downwind, all of a sudden they just stop and they're falling into the water. The one thing that was scary with them is that they, um, they don't really have any concept of the wind shadow that's behind a boat like this. <laughs> and, um, or beside it, depending on which way you're going. And we definitely had a few times when they would fall in the water, either just in front of the floater or just to lure the floater, and you know, swerving out of the way to get away from them, which was exciting. But they had a good time. And the 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 couple of guys, like that guy, I think, um, judging by the kite, if I remember correctly, that guy's the um, the foil kite boarding course racing world champion. So he didn't really have any trouble getting away from us, which is good. So we did that for five weeks in San Francisco Bay. We did 40 knots every day repeatedly. We had a, um, a young man who's um, a Mexican kid whose father is uh, in prison for multiple murders. He's head of a drug gang, and um, he has sort of a surrogate family who uh, who got him out of jail. And uh, he holds the, the speed record on San Francisco Bay. Never been on a boat before. But uh, he did 43.7 knots, which was pretty good. I just told him to point the thing straight, and we had a lucky puff. And, that was all it took, so he's now driven the boat faster than anybody else. <laughs> we, uh, we took the boat to Long Beach. There you can see us, um, the boss uh, crossing tacks with the ragamuffin one day uh, before the Transpac uh, race. So that's, uh, that would have been our competition, more or less, had we, had we started the race with, uh, with everyone else. The, I was talking before about the Transpac race, in every race, you have a race record and a course record. And our idea was the race record. Um, but a week before the event, we were looking at the weather, and the weather for the race start was just terrible, like light air and shitty, and all the routing that we were doing, we were saying it was going to be six and a half days to get there, even with our big boat. <clears throat> and so uh, we called up the boss on the Monday and said, hey, do you have any kind of moral or ethical objection to starting on Wednesday? Because that's the day that if we leave on Wednesday, we're going to be there instantly. You know, we're going to get the, the course record, not the race record. He says, well, what about on Saturday when we're supposed to start? I said, well, Saturday is going to be six days. He says, no, we're going on Wednesday then. So we, uh, we moved the start forward a little bit, which was good. Uh, this is, um, if I can make it work properly, I can. You can see here, this is basically the weather scenario that we had. Um, for the start, you can see we had, uh, because it's an El Nino year, you have all kinds of low pressure happening uh, in the southern part of the Pacific. Um, and basically, the lows, the lows are all down very far south, and that's just sucking breeze out of the north. So you have nice northerly flow the whole way, northerly going uh, northeasterly towards Hawaii as you get further along. So this was basically the, uh, the scenario at the start. Long, Long Beach being here, so we were sailing out like this, um, which was really good. You know, 20 to 25 knots at 110 true wind angle, or maybe a bit deeper, perfect, you know? So uh, so we started, and we got ourselves out past Catalina Island here, and then did a bit of reaching, and then put up the Jennifer and, and went across. Uh, like I said earlier, minimizing distance is the important thing. You can see it. Um, If we continue forward a little bit, so that's one day into it. You can see the same thing. You have, uh, you know, the breeze continuing out of the north the whole way across, and uh, 16. So we would have been like here after the first day, something like that, with breeze just going up and the generator going up. Um, continuing on. So the second day, somewhere in here, nice breeze, Jennifer still. Hawaii down here, the finish is here, so. Basically, this is what the start would have looked like for us. You can see here, it's, it's terrible. No breeze here, upwind, or you know, breeze out, of the, breeze out of the south, which is the opposite of what it normally is, and no wind here. A lot of the boats, they ended up Sailing downwind here, crossing over here, and starting to come back down again towards Hawaii. Meanwhile, we were already finished. Um, we did it in three days and 18 hours with a, with a course which looks like that. You, you couldn't have gotten a, a whole lot straighter than straight. This is only 
this is only 400 miles, which for us was 18 hours at the speed that we were doing. We did uh, one day in the middle where all this red is of 740 something miles. So we were pretty happy about that. And uh, the nice part about it was I said earlier that when we were doing the Calcedine art in the Newport of Bermuda, we had four people grinding, playing the traveler the whole time, reaching with the boat at a closer wind angle. But for the Transpac, fortunately, we were uh, we were down with the Jenniker. So uh, you can see we had the, the jib and the Jenniker behind it, and just sailing along in beautiful weather like that the whole way, which is awfully nice. I mean, our navigator didn't have a whole lot to do. He spent a lot of time with his legs crossed, looking out the back at the wake of the boat, which was <laughs> which was good. We did uh, we did do just a little bit of work. I had to go out and um, tighten the leech line on the Jenniker uh, once because after two or three days of sailing, it all stretched and it started to flap. So that was that was the sum total of the problems that we had, which was a huge relief from the uh, the race in 2013 when we hit everything there was to possibly hit in the ocean. Um, another lovely picture of the boat passing Diamond Head, which is the sort of iconic finish of the Transpac. We were very happy to be there. We uh, I go back a couple. We uh. We just barely didn't fall a ley line into the finish. This is about 20 miles here. If we had just gone 20 miles further, we'd have, we'd have hit the finish without any kind of, we'd have done one jive to finish the whole thing. So, pretty good. The obligatory celebration at the Waikiki Yacht Club, which was nice. I stayed there for three days after that. That's, you know, that's what you have to do. So, Transpac record, uh, four days and 19 hours, Geronimo of Olivier de Carcassonne in 2005. Uh, we finished in 2015 in three days and 18, and one day and one hour off of the record, which is, uh, which is a pretty decent difference. <laughs> the, the, the boss is very happy, which is the important thing. So, we left, um, we left Hawaii to go back through Panama, and then back to France. It took us, uh, it took us 10 days to get back to Panama. Five days out, sailing along in the middle of the night. The, everything's over. We're all good. We just have to get the boat back safely, give it back to the people we rented it from, and life is good. And um, about 2 in the morning, I was asleep, and I heard a bang. It woke me up. I said, shit, what is that? And I go up on deck, and everybody's grinding, and nobody's, pen like, nobody's excited. And I said, what was that noise? They said, oh, you know, you're just, you're just you're hearing things as you were asleep. I'm like, no, 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 absolutely not. I'm not hearing things. I said, slow the boat down, stop grinding in. Let's look around and figure out what, what's broken because there's something that's blown up. It's the weather side capture out, which has exploded. So you can see here, we took, um, this is the thimble that came out of the capture out that had blown up. So you had the capture out hanging from the rig and uh, the thimble hanging from its lashing there. Um, we had uh, four Jenniker sheets and a spare main sheet. We spliced them all together into four legs um, in the thimble, basically, to, uh, to, to simulate a capture out. Uh, we finished five days going into Panama like that, and then we sat in Panama and waited for the, uh, <coughs> for the new rigging to show up, which they built in, uh, they built in like five days, the new shroud for us. Just to get us home. Why didn't the rig come down with the catch out? Because the rig is like a telephone pole. Because it's ultra strong, it's meant to go around the world, and so it was over engineered ten years ago when they built the thing, and thank God it didn't fall down. So, uh. From the weather cap shroud. Blew up. Blew up. What's holding it then? There's a lower shroud and a stiffness of the tube. And because they were in the process of, I don't know whether they were taking a reef out or whether they were changing jibs or what they were doing, but they, the rig wasn't completely loaded up when it broke. Because they, they probably were, think they were going slowly and so the thing was slamming on the waves rather than cutting through them. And that shock load is what broke it. But because they didn't have all the sails shooted in completely, the rig stayed up. We we're just super lucky. So you can see what we did. So, started here across to Bermuda and back, down to Panama, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Hawaii, 
all the way back. We got south of the equator here because there were so many uh, little low pressure cyclones, whatever you want to call it here, that we went far south. Got a nice little equator crossing ceremony. I cut all my friends' hair off who've never been across the equator. <laughs> and then all the way back up there, because we wanted to go downwind, because we've done some, we've done a lot of upwind sailing here, so we made sure that we didn't do any upwind sailing here. So we went downwind and then motored through a zone of no wind and then downwind again to here to the finish. So we were very lucky. 25,000 miles, uh, managed to keep the rig up, which is basically the equivalent to, to a race around the world. We are pretty happy about that. And, uh, the last picture that I always like to show people is this one. This is the first day we went sailing on the boat when I said we were doing 40 knots uh, when we just put all the, uh, the rig in the boat and everything else. Uh, my wife was in the hospital with the, uh, when she was pregnant, and this little girl is the wife, is the daughter of the midwife, and um, she was uh, bragging to my wife that she's going to do the route to Rome when she's 20 years old, single-handed on a multi-hull, and could she come sailing with us on the boat? So we said, yeah, absolutely, you can come sailing, but we're not going to be around for long. There's going to be one opportunity, and that's going to be the day we put the boat in the water. So um, on the way back in from uh, from all of our sail testing. We let the nine-year-old drive all the way home. <laughs> the boat's doing 30, 35 knots there with a nine-year-old at the helm. And I wasn't holding on to it, I was letting her drive. She knows how to drive an optimist, so she can probably drive the boat. Man. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have all seen this, but I thought this was this is a very good video, so I figured it would be nice to Sorry. So today's a huge day for us. Uh, we're launching Lending Club 2, with a, a big program for the next six months of record breaking. Uh, it's a, a super exciting collaboration between uh, between Renova Plunge and myself. And we're going to uh, show everybody how it's done, I think.
to uh, deliver the, the implement uh, with uh, everybody else and run the uh, test type race, probably would have been on the record. It's a good example of uh, when, when you can't uh, win the game and change the rules. I have to say I'm pretty proud of what we managed to accomplish in seven months. We didn't have any any spare time at any stage, and um, it's a testament to the to the French people who designed and built the thing to start with that we managed to get through it all without uh, without breaking anything. And that's uh, that's basically it. You know, seven months of uh, seven months of hard work, basically uh, summed up in a three minute video. I guess it's uh, videos are worth ten thousand words, and pictures worth worth a thousand. <laughs> All right, let's start. Who wants to know something different from what I've talked about? <laughs> yeah? So, two hours of questions. Yeah, sure. What's it feel like driving that boat at the edge of the edge? And what kind of disaster plans do you have in your mind when you're driving at the edge of the edge and things just go completely crazy? There aren't any disaster plans because we never got the boat anywhere close to the edge. You can the, what happens is that the thing just slows down. It doesn't it won't go faster because the air drag and the water drag is so much it just stops you. So it stops you from pushing harder because you've already gone slower than you want to. Um, what it feels like when you're driving it at that speed, you, you mean you have to stand like this and you have to brace yourself and hang on because the boat has you know, got a lot of power and there, there's two rudders in the water and they have a lot of power. And so uh, you know, whenever the guests were saying, I told them, you have to take control of the boat, don't let it take control of you and hang on to the thing. And that's what it feels like. Who else? Did that boat have curved foils for their pinnings? Yeah, it was designed with them. And they have adjustable angle of attack as well, so you can put more angle of attack onto them if you want to. We didn't have to do it very often, but it has them. In the back? So, again, look forward 15 years and what happens with this boat. How will it be used? Uh, I don't know about 15 years, but that boat is um, that boat has just sailed around the world again as EDEC. Um, in the, in the little match race they had with Spindrift, that's the same boat. Um, he's going to do the Jules Verne again this winter coming up with the crew, and then the winter after that, he's sailing single-handed around the world with the boat again. Wow. Yeah. Are there signs of fatigue? I mean, this is this is a big, lightly built. Yeah. The, you know, when the boat broke up. <laughs> When they broke up off of New Zealand, they did a lot of reinforcement. So the beams now, they have probably three quarters of an inch of solid carbon on the part where the beam turns and goes down to the floaters, on the top and on the bottom, with bolts holding it all together. And that's made a massive difference. After the route to run, the, uh, the central hull was trying to come off of the front beam. And so they went back to the architects and they, they, they designed a reinforcement where they basically took unidirectional carbon and they wrapped it around the beam and through the bulkhead of the hull and back up around the beam again in five <coughs> places to hold it on. So I mean the boat is in a constant state of um, being reinforced as things get close to failure. I would say at this point it's in pretty good shape. Um, we didn't cause any more damage and EDEC didn't cause any more damage either in there around the world and they pushed it probably harder than we did. So. I would say at this point it's reached the, the stage where it's not breaking anymore, and the fatigue life of carbon composites is huge. So, you know, I think for at least the next 10 years the boat's going to be okay. I, I guarantee you the boat will end up with lifting coils in it, um, just like the new Mass C for those boats in, in short order. So, has it gained enough water weight? No, the boat's lighter than when it was launched. Yeah, there's um, there's a lot of extraneous stuff that they put on it for the Jules Verne, which has since been taken off. Um, for example, the, the rig that we sailed around, we used the big rig for the boat, not the single-handed rig, because we knew the transback was light air downwind and we wanted as much horsepower as we could get. 
And that rig weighs 1,600 kilos for the tube and the shrouds. The um, single-handed rig weighs 800. So you have a massive savings right there. And then uh, just taking the weight of the people off because they know they don't have to sail with 11 people anymore. You know, we were doing, when we delivered it back, uh, in between Panama and, um, and France, we did three days over 700 miles with six delivery crew on the boat. Yep. considered flat water on that boat? Anything smaller than that? <laughs> Basically, if it's, if, it's any, if it's any bigger than the height of the floater, then the thing is going all over the place and you have to start trying to slow down a little bit. Do you still enjoy sailing at like 5 or 10 knots or do you need 40 to... <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what I'm doing. I mean, I can, I can force myself to enjoy it, but if, it, if, it, if it's for fun sailing, yeah, I love it. If it's racing, I'm a little bit bored to be honest. I assume when you went to Bermuda, seven guys in 24 hours, you're probably all excited. Nobody slept, I'm guessing. But in the trans pack, what would a sleep and watch schedule? Uh, kind of like everyone does in the offshore world these days. Everybody has a partner um, who does the same job that you do, and you never see that person. Like um, we had two bowmen on the boat, and they it was, so it was three hours on for one, and three hours on for the other, and the other one would sleep, and then you just rotate it, and so you have. At any given stage, you have a, uh, a driver, a trimmer, and a bowman, or two trimmers and a bowman, basically. Yeah? Uh, how far does the rig camp? In, uh, doesn't. It doesn't move. You don't, you don't camp that rig? It's never been. That boat is not meant to sail around with the central hull out of the water, which means at most it's going to heal over 10 degrees, which means it's not worth the added weight of camping the rig. Because 10 degrees is not really. You're not gaining very much in 10. If the boat if the boat heels over 15, and you can bring the rig up to vertical, then you're a lot more riding low and everything else. But 10 degrees is not really very much for the thing. So they, they just they went with lighter weight rather than potentially more power. They did, they made that decision with everything. That's why the beams broke and all the rest of it because they were just looking for the lightest possible thing they could with just the minimum amount of power needed to get it going. At what point do you have the decision between the lowest sailing angle that you'll sail that boat? Like there, there must be an angle of which you say, we're not going to go below this angle. And, and what would be the optimum apparent wind angle for that boat for the highest speed? Um, the apparent wind angle with the Jenniker up is never further aft than 55 degrees. Okay. Um, ever, even in light air. Well, what's that true? True, 100 and, in light air, it's 100. And 30 and in heavy air, it's 155. Um, and the way you figure out your VMG angle downwind is you sail the boat as deep as you can before the weather floater wants to start falling down and touching. You okay. never want the weather floater to touch, but that's the limit. You just you keep it just healed so the weather floater stays out and you keep the apparent wind up, and that's VMG. Okay. Yeah, in the back? Is there any um, new boats being built now? Yeah, there are. There's um, Gitana, who have a Mod 70 right now, and an Emoka 60. They're in the process of building a 100-footer designed by Guillaume Verdier. That'll be a full foiling 100-foot trimaran. And um, Bank Populaire, who owned the boat before we got it, is also in the process of doing a new 100-footer. Um, Sotobo with Tomac Oville is also building a new boat. Will that outdate this boat then? All of them, yeah. Yeah, this boat's already 10 years old. And it gets leased. So you guys leased it? Well, we, we leased it from the people who own it. The people who own it is EDEC, the people who just sailed around the world. And he's going to own the boat for the, for the foreseeable future. He's, and I guarantee he won't lease it to anyone else again. He, ne he needed to lease it because he needed our cash to be able to buy it. But after that, he wants to keep it for himself. You know? But you guys made a lot of improvements on it for him, too. Well, we at least maintained it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When we got it, it was in pieces. We put it together, kept it nice, and gave it back. So Who else? I like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you think four leg offshore trimarans will work? For sure, it'll work. Is it safe? Not really, but it'll work. I mean, imagine when you hit something offshore and you're Five feet in the air already. How hard the impact is going to be? You know, you saw that. You saw when um, when Team New Zealand fell off the foil and three of their guys ended up in the water in San Francisco Bay. Imagine doing that with a hundred footer doing forty knots. 
and it's it's certainly possible, but it's you know it's certainly less safe than they already are. Or if you hit tsunami. Fortunately, all that stuff has sort of gone into the drain in the middle of the Pacific, and it doesn't seem to be all over the race course anymore. It was then, but it, now it's much more concentrated. Thank God. Do you feel flex in the boat? In the boat? Yeah. 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 That, I mean, you feel some flex. I mean, like like any like like an F boat almost about the same amount proportionately. But the, the crazy thing is, is, it pitches quite a lot in big waves, especially. And you go into a wave and the bows go underwater. When they come up, because there's a component of side load, when they come out of the water, they're pulling sideways a little bit, and so they go boom, 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 sideways, all three of them. And that's horrible. It happens. it happens every wave. Every wave when you're going up wind, you, don't, you can't imagine how it can possibly take it. And the, the outer skin on the bows of the boats is only three layers of carbon thick. It's super light, and it's surviving. Somehow, it still survives. <laughs> yeah, they fill your Emoka things in your future career and cash with a six month charter. Does that change some of your professional development? You're going to lean more towards monohulls a month ago? Or no, you know, I, I love doing all kinds of different sailing. I learned something. I learned more from doing different things than I do from doing the same thing all the time. And for me, it doesn't really make any difference. You know, I mean, I go where the interesting things to do are. And in the beginning, it was Emoka, and now with the multi halls, there's a lot of interesting things to be done. And I think that as a sailor, I'm going to be better off having sailed a lot of multi halls just because um, when you're holding onto the tiller, it's very direct when you're doing something wrong, and you learn a lot more about trimming the sails and the balance of the boat. With a mono hall, you have a keel, which is like a shock absorber, and so you don't really feel the balance of the boat as well. And so, for me, the multi hull in that respect is a lot better. On the other hand, uh, a mono hull has plenty of advantages as well, not the least of which is that you don't have to rely on a freighter to collect you if you make a mistake. But you know, uh, they're they both have their they both have their strong points, and they're both a lot of fun. So, I just consider myself fortunate more than anything. Yeah. How loud is it below the if the central hull is coming out of the water, it's completely silent. <laughs> if the central hull is in the water, it's loud. I mean, it's like it's like 30% uh, worse than being in the subway, more or less. That's the way. That's what we like in it too, like uh, camping out on the subway. <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you carry any special uh, safety gear? No, uh, on a big boat like that, if you have time, if you know if the boat's, it's going to be obvious if the boat's going to go over, and you more or less have time to run into the roof and protect yourself. And basically, if there's a capsize happening, the only goal is to get into the roof so that when the boat falls over and the rig breaks, you don't end up smashed between the rig and the sails and the hull which is going to land on top of you. So basically everyone dives into the roof and tries to get inside the central hull as quickly as possible. But no, we don't have, I mean, we had one spare air tank just to, if you had something around the propeller or whatever, but like, like I was saying earlier, the boats, it's not nervous like that. You know that an AC-72 is 45 feet wide and 140 feet tall. We're 75 feet wide and 140 feet tall. You know, with, and so you, everything happens much, much slower and it's much more difficult to turn the thing over. Um, so when you, when you get waves and you get a lot of spray coming up across the deck, how how often does somebody almost literally get ripped off the boat? And Never. It's not like a Volvo 70. There's you, you're not getting green water. You're getting spray. At the you know like at the worst, you're hanging onto the sheet and uh, the, the wave hits you and it hurts because it's moving so fast. But it's never hitting you with force that would move you around. You have to be a little bit careful if you're up on the bow and the boat digs in. Then you might get some green water that hits you, but. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's way, 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 way drier than a Volvo 70. Like you, there's no, there's no discussion between the two. You, the Volvo 70 is a dangerous boat. A big multi hull is like, like, for example, I, I wore flip flops the entire time I sailed on the boat. Never, put, never put boots or shoes on the whole time. It's that, it's that easy. Speak a little more about the gear you wore. Um. 
foul weather top with a latex neck and latex wrists, like a dry top, normal foul weather bottoms, and normally shorts and t-shirt underneath of it. It's just because it's wet, you know, you get constant spray, it's not because, and, and because you're moving so fast, there's a lot of apparent wind, and so it, you get, you can get cold, you get evaporative cooling all the time. And so you basically just have to create a wind and waterproof barrier and underneath of it you sweat like a you sweat like a pig because it's sunny, you know. But that's basically it. And often I would wear a hat just to keep to keep from having water in my hair all the time. You know, I uh, during the five weeks we were in San Francisco, I drove the boat all day every day for five weeks and um, I got cold like every by the end of every day from standing up in the wind I was freezing, whereas the people who were grinding who were sitting behind the roof we're fine. Who makes those flip flops? Reef. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a special case with the flip flops. It's, I haven't put any shoes on except for today and yesterday in like two years. <laughs> it's just too cold here. <laughs> Who's next? Anybody in the back anywhere? Yeah? Are there lifting spoils on the rudders? No. No? No, nah, there aren't. The boat would probably be a tiny bit faster with lifting foils on the rudders, but then you have to think of what it would catch on them as well. And would it really be faster because of that? So you have one lure of uh, rudder, I mean a back a, lure. A C-foil, yeah. And that gets the lure out a little bit? Lots. If, you have it, if you're reaching and you have it all the way down, it'll fly up out of the water. Like That much of the foil will support the whole weight of the boat and the, the, the floater will sit out of the water. And if you have any waves, it'll launch and then fall the lure. So yeah, so when you when you're sailing, when you're reaching, you have to reduce the amount of foil you have in the water to reduce the power of it to keep the thing from leaping up and falling to lure. Because that's obviously really hard on the foil drop when you've dropped the weight of the boat onto it. Yeah. You know? So yeah, we lift the you know lifting up the the foil like a foot and a half when you're reaching long to just keep it less powerful so the thing won't break. What moves the foil? Like Rope and a winch. Okay. And it moves easily. How big is the foil? What's the cord? Uh, it takes six people to pick it up. Oh. Uh, it's the cord is probably 18 inches, and the whole thing. It, I don't know. If I was standing here, from the tip of the foil, which would be here curving down to the floor and then going up to that table, basically, the, this end of the table. So it's it's got a radius of like, it's got a radius of like 12 feet and it's like a 14 foot long piece of carbon, something like that. And it's like three and a half inches thick and it's almost solid carbon. Yeah, to, to put it in the boat, you put it in from underneath because it has a little winglet on it. And so it takes four people lifting the end that has to go in, and then two people lifting the other end, pushing. That was the original, original Yeah, originally designed. Yeah. I think there's, I think it's a second iteration of the shape, but it's the same. <coughs> Nothing has really changed. It's just a little bit of a different shape. In the back. <laughs> what does she need to major in in college? She needs to major in uh, in uh, mechanical or or um, materials engineering. Yeah, mechanical or materials engineering probably, or uh, or math. Probably more actually probably more like electrical engineering because in twenty years time electronics are going to be even more important than they are now, and that's where we find the lack actually right now is enough qualified people to deal with electronics on boats like this. Um, but she's going to have to really not pay a whole lot of attention to what's going on in college and actually get a degree at the same time because she's going to have to start sailing tomorrow <laughs> to be at a stage to do the return when she's 20. Yep? Yeah? Uh, if you have interest in some of the maxi model hulls, uh, how do you compare them? Um, biggest model hull I've sailed on in terms of race boats is an 80 footer. And it's slow. They're like there, there's no comparison. Like this, the the trimaran does a 700 mile day uh, on delivery with people not paying attention, drinking beer, and um, Comanche just set the new Molino Hall record of what 628 miles or something, and they 
we're at 40, 35 degrees of heel the whole time and had 20, 30 people on board pushing as hard as we possibly could. I mean, there's just no difference. There's no comparison between a monohull and a multi-hull, except when I go back to the fact that you don't have to have a trade to pick you off if you turn thing over. I, you know, like there's a, and I, I'm sure I'll offend some of you, but I'm sure there's plenty of multi-hull fanatics in this room who are like religious that multi-hulls are the way to go, and that people that sail on leaners are idiots and all the rest of it. But you know, when you got to get picked up because your shit's flipped over in the middle of the ocean, a monohull makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Yep. Um, how much of the boat has hydraulics on None. No hydraulics. So the, the grinders are all geared to drive shafts and all that? Yeah, the grinders are all drive shafts. There's some, there's some in between the, so you have the pedestal and then you have a, a reduction gear and then you have the winch. So you have three speeds in the winch in the high gear and then you can turn on the reduction gear and then those three speeds in the winch become another three speeds. So you basically have six speeds in all the winches in an attempt to get the gearing low enough so that basically uh, in the lowest gear, two people can just barely turn the handles with the big jib upwind. Yep. What are your, uh, what are your key concepts for driving fast upwind versus driving fast downwind? On a big boat, it's because the apparent wind is always the same. It's really kind of hard to decide whether you're going upwind or whether you're reaching or what. We spent a lot of time looking at the true wind angle, to be honest with you. And we spent a lot of time looking at the heel angle. Like I was saying, downwind the VMG is when you just keep the floater out of the water. Um, upwind, it's, it's a bit of the same thing, but you basically are just trying to sail with the, the central hull, just kissing or tapping the wave tops. You know, just pretty much like any other multi-hull, I think. There's no different big or small, it's just a different scale, you know. But so that's, I mean, looking at the, looking at the true wind angle number on the displays and just kissing. You know, it's, it's funny, the boat actually sort of falls into a sweet spot upwind where you bear away and it sort of struggles and loads up and you come up a little bit and it just stops. But like, just before you bear away and it struggles and loads up, it goes very fast and it's easy to sail. So it's very easy to find upwind. Downwind it's more difficult because you can sail you can sail any angle you want and the apparent wind never changes at all and the speed only changes slightly so you have to really figure out getting down. Getting down, you know, like you always feel like you're gonna be better off than just ripping along, but actually five degrees down going the same speed is just five degrees you've given up, right? So it's it's you kinda have to pay more attention downwind than you do Huh? You're always sailing BMG down to destination. Well, yeah, just just like anybody else, you know. I mean, um, unless you're unless you're sailing to straight to a point, and then you 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 know you you're you're sailing for the anticipated shift, or otherwise you're sailing BMG, and you have to pay attention to it. You know, like a lot of people are like, oh, you were ocean up wind and all this kind of thing, but if you know you got to tack, you can't bear away. You just have to go because in, in a boat like this, there is no such thing as ocean up wind because ocean up wind for a small boat means you crack off because the waves are big and you're going to go faster and your BMG is going to be better. But this thing, you don't want to crack off. You want to just you want to do 19 knots at 42 true wind angle and you're going to get there very quickly, you know. And until the waves are like this, you can upwind, you go straight through them, you know. So there's not much worry. One more question. Yeah. You said you had someone stationed on, on, the, uh, on the jib sheet all the time? Wh whatever the head sail was, when we were doing records, there was always somebody. How about the main or the main traveler? The traveler sometimes. Like in the, in the first two records, because it was, uh, it was reaching, we were playing the traveler all the time, we always had somebody there. Mm -hmm. But um, when you're sailing with the Jenniker, uh, you have somebody on the Jenniker sheet, and you have the driver, and the drive, you know, it's not going to really help. People say it can actually hurt you to use the mainsail, you know? Mm -hmm. Whether that's true or not, I'm, I haven't really decided or not, but m most any time, if you, if the hull comes up when you're going downwind, you're already bearing away, and the boat will pretty much always bear away, and then, you know, you start to use the, you use the jenniker sheet just to get the bow to come up out of the water a little bit, and then I think we'll just surf off downwind and you're fine. So we always, 
when you're going fast like that and you're pushing hard, there's always somebody on the four cell sheet. And somebody's sitting around, like what happens basically is that you have the guy driving, you have the guy to lure it on the jib sheet or the gen or whatever sheet, and then a couple of guys sitting underneath the roof, and the main sheet leads pretty much under the roof. And so if the Jenniker sheet and the driver weren't enough and the boat started to lift up a long ways, the guy on the roof is going to be able to get the main sheet used before there's an issue. So you, you kind of have somebody on both, but not so much. It's not somebody sitting there waiting. Do you ever have circumstances where you had to do that? You just don't, you're just not stupid. I mean, the thing's so big, you can't be dumb. You, you can't you can't fight the boat. You have to be smart. That's why you know like you see the age of the crew on the boat. There's uh, you know I was one of the youngest people on the boat because you just have to be smart. You you can't you can't fight it. You can't work harder than it can. You can't lift more than it can. You can't do anything. It's like like I said, it's like selling an apartment building around. You know you gotta just let it. You just gotta be, you gotta be ahead of the game every time. So. Right. How long does it take to roll the tenor for a week? Throwing a reef in the main takes about three minutes. Rolling up the Jennifer takes about eight or nine. Putting a reef in the main, you just get it off a lock and let it fall down. I mean, it takes no time. You can the reef line. You can if you if you drop the halyard, you can pull the reef line in ninety five percent of the way by hand. Because the sail the, the the main sail weighs what does it weigh? It weighs four hundred and fifty kilos or something. With the batten, so it's going to fall down. It's, it, holds, it doesn't stay up there by itself, you know. <laughs> All right, thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, you mentioned that uh, you learned how uh, to keep your to, to keep water from uh, water spray from your head. So we have this uh, Nemo head, and I want to present it to you as this. <laughs> Uh, you know, kind of appreciation talking for you know your travel and yeah, your thank you very us. much. I appreciate it. It's been very nice to you all. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, you know, I'm very happy to you know this program for me. I'm proud of for all the records we did, but mostly I'm proud because I'm hoping to get more people involved in what we do. And yeah. you know, I think that having everybody out on the boat is a good way to go forward with that. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. And, uh,